preaching today, when I was a kid, you know, you, the preacher, you'd go to church and he'd have a message and you'd go, okay, he's talking to the sinners in the room. And then the next week you come to church, okay, he's, he's talking to the saints. And, and so now in today's church culture, it's kind of a say inner message. <laughs> it's, it's just, uh, you don't know who really is a believer. Can I get my help this morning? My, my, my help. We don't know who really is a believer uh, in the room. And, and there's a lot of people who think because they come to church, they're a believer. People get, I can tell by some of your faces already, oh Lord, we don't need one of those messages this Sunday, do we? Do we really need one of those messages this Sunday? So um, then you have people who are new to the faith or just immature. And, and if you're not careful as a preacher, you can, you can, you can throw the baby out with the bathwater and discourage the new believers so bad uh, uh, they won't come back to this church. They may go to another one. And, and so you got all that in your mind as a preacher. And one of the things that I'm really struggling with as a preacher is how well our flock, our people know the gospel. Um, and here's what I'm discerning because I, I sense your lack of joy. I sense your lack of love for yourself. We lack the self-compassion. You know, the Bible says, love your neighbor as yourself. I don't want some of you doing to me what you do to yourself. The way that we overeat and the way that we treat our bodies and the way that we treat ourselves, it's very clear to me that there are times that we are gospel deficient. And so how do I preach the gospel and keep our new Christians from thinking I'm Fred Phelps? <laughs> And how do we preach the gospel and then move into the new life that God has created for us? So that's what we're going to kind of be looking at this morning. And I'm hoping that we land in James 2 by the time we're done. But we're going to start in Ephesians 2 because the gospel is what's on the line. Not, not your political party. Not who's getting married, not what flags are being raised up and not being raised up. If the gospel isn't what is on the line when you're talking, you're wasting your breath. If it's not the love of God and understanding what God has called, because what I'm fearing is the people that claim to be defending faith lack the joy to be speaking on behalf of the king. We got a bunch of begrudgingly people serving the kingdom. And I don't, I'm looking around the room and I really don't feel like the most of the people in this room feel like the gospel is the better life. And that concerns me as a pastor. Is this the better life for you? Before you go going off on Facebook, are you living the dream life according to the gospel? Selah. It's like, well, you know, here we go. He's going to talk about offering again. Golly. Ah, tithing. Everything is begrudging. Well, let's just go on in there. Maybe DJ will cuss or something, you know, let's just go see what happens. Begrudgingly, oh gosh, Saturday night, it's time for me to teach Sunday school. Uh, let me just see what I can do, you know. And, and, and then and, and you go to work and it's begrudgingly. And then on Friday, like, you wanna go to church with me? No, I'm good, I'm gonna go to the club. They're happy there. I mean, they're happier at the Ellen show than we are. And I'm sure there's, at Ellen's show, there's all these different personalities, and I'm sure everybody's not outwardly expressive, but when she comes out there, it's like, woo, woo, and they can't dance, and they're off rhythm, and some of those people don't know the music, they don't know the song, they're not complaining, they're not whining. Then we're going to come to a place where we believe we were dead in our sin, and Christ made us alive, and it's just like, I'm going to begrudgingly come in here, and I'd rather, you know, do something different, I'd rather be somewhere else. And then they start inviting people to that. Once you come to the place that we kind of, that's how, the reason why, one of the reasons why I didn't get saved is because most Christians were like, you know what, I was happier in my past, but now I'm saved. And I kind of wish I could do and I could be what I used to be, but you know, uh, <laughs> come with us. No, thank you. I'm good. So that's what we're going to get into. If I could, I would have that song, Happy, after every one of my points. Because I'm happy. The, the four things I'm going to give you, if this is where you draw your joy from, you don't draw your joy from this country looking the way that it's, you think it's supposed to look. 
Your joy comes from your name was wrote in the Lamb's Book of Life. The disciples in Luke 10 were sent out. They were sent out and everything went well. And Jesus said, don't rejoice because it's going well because some days you're up, some days it's down. But you're in. You're in God's presence. You have the king in your heart. You've been put on mission. You've been called. You've been chosen to be the one to share this joy with others, whether they receive it or not. My man Jonathan always says, I'm just delivering the mail. You know, you know if, if your phone bill comes due, you don't beat up the mailman, you know. My Sprint bill, you better call Sprint. <laughs> I'm just delivering the booger. <laughs> And, and, and could you imagine like the post office got in trouble because people weren't paying their bills and they were blaming the post office for it? And the church is acting like we incur some debt every time somebody doesn't give their... Anyway, visions too. I'll just go into the text. This drives me nuts. We might make it to James. We might not. And guess what? I don't care. I've been driving 18 hours. <laughs> I'm just playing with you. He's like, I'm going to begrudgingly preach this morning. Why don't you guys got any joy? What's wrong with you? <laughs> Somebody be happy around here. Ooh, I love this. I'm going to try to suppress my inner charismatic so I don't scare nobody. <laughs> but this makes me happy. This makes me excited. Just, I'm reading the King James Version too. That's, that's how fired up I am this morning. I'm going to use thou and thee and all that just, just to throw off you young people, you know. Where are your English majors at now when you use King James? Where are you at now? Chase, yeah, I can say. <laughs> and you, say, and me. and me. Oh, I love it. <laughs> he made alive. He made you alive. If you're a believer, if you're a kingdom citizen, he made you alive. You were dead to your sin and to yourself. And he, being Christ, made you alive. No effort on your part. That's what I believe. That's me. You can believe whatever you want. You can believe I have decided to follow. Ah, okay. Until he makes you alive, you can't decide to follow. He made you alive. Just like Adam. Adam didn't go, I, he was this clump of dirt. I just want to exist and become a body so that I can walk around and talk and get no. No. The dirt, was, the dirt couldn't, con, could not imagine Adam until God breathed and formed and made new life happen in him. Who were dead in trespasses and sin, too. And when she walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, there are people who just don't want to do what God says, okay? That's how we were. You, if you don't start here, if you're a good person and then you got saved and Christ made you a better person, that's not the kingdom. I'm talking to the people who were dead. The Bible said, do this, and you went, bam, I'm doing this. And then all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit comes into your life, starts changing your affections, starts changing your taste buds, changes your life. And you start getting processed to the word the old people call sanctification. It's an old word. We got to bring these ancient words back and start studying them and understand what the scriptures are saying. Third, among whom also we are all conducting ourselves in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and we're by nature children of wrath, just as the others. The fourth verse, most powerful words in Scripture, those first two words, but God. The most powerful two words in Scripture to me. Everything was messed up. Oh, I have note sheets back there too, by the way, if you want them. <laughs> I forgot to mention that. <laughs> there are note sheets in the back, so when you leave, take them with you so you don't... You... <laughs> but God! <laughs> forgot. So God started it. Man blew it. God finished it. God started it in the, in, in the beginning. In the beginning was what? Was God. God started it, we believe. Man comes on the scene. He blows it. God comes in, he finishes it, he fixes it, okay? But God, who was rich in his mercy, in his great love, fifth verse, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. I love it. 
and raised us up together, and notice it's saying us, and made us to sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God's, and the gift of God, not of works, as any should boast, for we are his workmanship. The Greek, that's poema. It's where we get the word poem. It's where we get the word lyric. You are God's life song. That means you have a new song now. So you used to be singing, ba-bum, ba-bum, bum. It's Monday, got to go to work. Ba-bum, ba-bum, bum. Can't stand my kids. But now I have a new song. My life is a new song. I have a new melody, a new rhythm to my heart now. Creating Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared before him that we should walk in them. Let's pray. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we pray that your work would be spoken clearly, that it comes straight from you, that our hearts would be open. Help us with the distractions. Help us with our biology so that our spirit man can be fed and fed well. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. I'm going to give you four things that I see in this text that you should be happy about. And we, if we could, I'd get up and we'd do the Carlton. Happy, clap your hands. I mean, we'd do the Carlton this morning. These are four things, no matter what's going on in the planet. So you get online, type in Bank of Commerce, you check your account, and you go, ah, I just wanted to do this, but now I can't. But you can still have something to take to the bank. You can still have something you can be happy about. All right, that's what we're going for. And then we're going to segue that into James 2, because James 2 deals with not treating people correctly. And he talks about the rich people come to church and you get excited. Oh, the vice president of Ash Grove is here. Oh, I don't know if he's here or not, but he could be. I don't know who that is. All right. And then a, a mother, single mother, four kids. They got dirty fingernails. They got dirty feet. They come in. And you place them in the back somewhere in the corner. And James was like, are you kidding me? Are you kidding? And we do. We have this super celebrity driven. Even our Christians who are celebrities are a bigger deal than people in this room. Like we have ministries that are super Christian ministries. And then we have ministries that are just for the baby, little baby Christian. And all this silliness. And James is like, that's all silliness. But before we go to that, I want to first help you understand this and make sure we're on the same page here. So that when we go to that, because I think James 2 is really weighty. I think James 2 is, is very difficult. There are some of you in this room who are okay with me as a black male because I'm your kind of black male. Ooh, that's, you know, but if my name was Jamal, my jaws were a little further down and I kind of had some swag to me. You're not kind of comfortable with that black male. And as Christians, we don't get to put labels on human beings and go, well, I'm a DJ a little better than this guy over here because DJ is this and this guy is not. And James said, in the kingdom, in church, that's not what's supposed to be going on. That's a tough amen. We have to admit, we have to admit, I'm sorry. There are some people that I just sometimes want to avoid. I, I, I struggle, you know, I was poor, but I can't just sit anywhere in a nasty house. I can't do it. I'm like, mm, uh, 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 uh. I, I struggle. That's one of the, I'm being real. This is my struggle. You know, I, I, I like some of the comforts, not all of them. I don't need a whole lot, but nastiness don't fly for me. So I have to pray before I go into the home and say, Lord, let your spirit move through me. And, and if I understood my own nastiness, if I would recall how sickly I was, how nasty I was, and if I would remember that I was nasty and sick and untouchable and unclean, and then Jesus died on the cross for me and came when he rose again, he rose me up with me and made me alive, then I should be able to go into any environment. But, you know, you catch me on the wrong Tuesday. I don't have all of that. First reason you can be happy is in the first verse. I'm happy because I'm alive. I'm happy because I'm alive. That's a reason to be happy. Not just alive physically, but alive spiritually. 
See, God's remedy for the broken earth is new life. That's God's solution for this broken earth is people turning their lives over to him. New life starts taking place, and then we go on mission. We go on mission every day. Every day you wake up, you're on a short-term mission trip if you're a kingdom citizen. You're on a short-term mission trip. You don't have to go nowhere. You don't have to go nowhere. Even if you stay home and if you have kids, you're on a short-term mission trip. Okay? You don't know. They got their earbuds in. They're listening to Drake and everything else. It's time to do mission. They're listening to Drake. <laughs> time to do mission. Every day we got mission. New life. Colossians 2.13 says this about new life. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all of our trespasses. So you want something to be happy about? If this doesn't make you happy, there is nothing left that I can give you. We, if you're a person who doesn't know what I'm talking about, you're a new Christian, if this doesn't make you go, who I want that, I don't have. And so these churches are, these churches are, they're, they're trying to, you know, we're going to have Seinfeld at church because we're trying to get people to be happy. And I can't, what you need, the world can't give you. You're going to constantly be chasing after something else. This is it. There's nothing. That's why Paul said, all I do is preach Christ crucified. Because he said, I ain't got nothing else for you. I don't, I don't know what else to give you. I don't. And some of you change your mind every two days anyway. So it's like, oh my gosh. You got fake hair, fake nails, fake eyebrows, fake eyelashes. Looking for a real man. I'm like, Lord, help us. Help us, Lord. Help us. Oh, I'm like, we're so needy. Guys, I have the solution here. He's saying, I made you life. I'm the source. I'm the source. Just like your, your car battery, your, your car and your, your charger, your phone charger, you know, it has to have a source. After a while, it starts getting drained. This is where the family fight starts taking place, you know. Somebody took your charger by your bed and you're trying to figure out how you're not killing it by the house. Uh, is anybody seeing my charger? Have you seen it? Has anybody seen my charger? No, really. I'm not laughing. Do you see me laughing? <laughs> Who took my charger? This is serious. I think that's where World War III is going to come from. I really do. Some old man's going to be sitting there talking. Well, son, Germany went over to Russia and took their chargers. And so they just started fighting. Take our chargers. It's not going to be a nuclear war. It's going to be a charger war. None of the phones match. You can't use your old phone charger. That just drives me nuts. You're looking for a charger. And this is what we do. We, 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 we come in and we, we get connected and we're made alive. And then we go, oh, I'm good. And we start drifting from the gospel, right? I'm good. And our battery starts going down. And we keep getting put in these situations that are warning us and telling us, your battery's going down. Your battery's going down. But you, you just ignore it because you're like, I still got some energy left. I'm just for key. I got a helper here. Yes. Made alive. Staying connected to what has made you alive. Jesus said this in John 15, 4. I don't think I gave you that one, Connie, sorry. John 15, 4, she's back there talking bad. Love you, Connie. John 15, 4, abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he is the one that bears much fruit for apart from me you can do nothing. So if you're looking for something greater than being connected to Christ, in the kingdom, we don't have anything better for you. <laughs> so if this sounds boring, if this sounds lame, if this doesn't, I can't help that. I can't, I can't change. All I can do is just keep loving you, keep sharing with you. I don't get the privilege of making you want this. David said, taste and see that the Lord is good. I got a second reason for you to be happy. Because I'm happy company. I wish you guys knew how to do the Carlton. Nobody knows? Okay. I'll quit. You guys are a rough crowd. <laughs> Nobody here has ever seen the Fresh Prince. It's all right. You guys are super saved. God bless you. <clears throat> I'm happy because I didn't get what I deserved, according to Ephesians 2.4. But God, who is rich in his love for us or rich in his mercy for us, mercy is not getting what you deserve. That's what mercy is. Mercy is not getting what you deserve. 
You should be happy that you didn't get what you deserve. You deserve to lay dead in your sin. So before you start begrudgingly set the country straight, (laughs) as some of you are really trying to do via Facebook, I'm going to set the country straight via Facebook. As you do that, keep in mind that you needed mercy too. You still need mercy and you are going to need mercy. So rest in the peace of knowing that you haven't gotten what you deserve and start there. This is tough. See, now you understand something now. You got to understand something. The super, super saved. I'm talking about my super saved people. Sometimes I call them over saved. They don't like that message. They don't like this message of mercy. They don't like, when do you get to the truth? This is the truth. We're walking through the text. The truth of the matter is, we were dead to sin. Mercy came on the scene. I didn't get the death I deserve. I got life now. Remember that about yourself as you're daily functioning. Titus 3.5, a cool book. As a matter of fact, if you're pregnant in here, name your kid Titus. I think that's a cool name. (laughs) Just a little suggestion. Titus. Sounds like a baller, don't it? Place for KU, not Missouri, KU. Titus. He saved us not because of works done by us in righteousness. You see, same theme here. But according to his own mercy by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. I'm talking about mercy is why you're in this room if you're a believer. Mercy is why you woke up. Mercy is why you have the sense you have. You don't deserve to have, some of y'all are from the 70s. You know you don't deserve to have no sense. You know it. You lived during the 70s. During, you survived disco music for God's sake. You know you shouldn't be here. <laughs> You listen to, won't you take me to funky town? Won't you take me? And you are saved. You kidding me? The Bee Gees and you're here. Somebody got, whoo, yeah, the Bee Gees. You can repent, repent. You have something to be happy about. You have something to be happy about whether or not what you want to happen happens. Right now, you have something to be happy about. Whether or not what you want to happen is happening. You have something to be happy about. I'm just throwing this out there. You, you actually have something to take joy in right now as we speak. If you get real with yourself, you have, wow, whew, that's good, man. I'm here. I don't, I, I, I had a guy tell me, he said, you know why, DJ, why I like your preaching? I said, don't tell me that because I got a big, I'll get a big head, you know. I prefer you never to tell me that I spoke a good sermon. Just nod your head at me. (laughs) And he goes, no, really, because he says, you don't take your salvation for granted. I said, brother, I got in on a banana peel, I feel like. I do. I feel like I just slipped. Whoa, I got saved? I'm not supposed. And then I'm preaching? Oh, oh, oh. God is, I don't know how you do that, God. That's, I have no clue. And people always drag their kids to me that are messing up right now. You said you messed up. I wish, if I could write a book for this, I would. But God said, we already got one. Tell them to open it up. (laughs) We already got one. We don't need another book. DJ, we can fix racism. We got to have another conversation. I'm like, I'm tired of the conversation. Somebody just act like they love Jesus and then treat people like you love Jesus. I mean, it's in the book. I I thought that was a great analogy about the gutter. Just keep your mind out the gutter and you'll be shocked at what could happen. God, another conversation? (sighs) Sorry. I got three reasons for you to be happy. Reason number three to be happy. It's found in the fifth and the sixth verse. I'm happy because I am with Christ and I am in Christ. The fifth and the sixth verse of Ephesians 2. I am with Christ. I am, I was, I was just thinking about this. Uh, Jonathan, I was reading in Genesis where God told the serpent, I'm going to curse you and you're going to be on your belly. That curse was meant for me. I mean, I could, look, we, we look at this devil and go, yeah, devil, that, that could be us. Literally on our bellies wallowing, and now you and me of all people are with Christ, in Christ, and and the writer says, up with him. 
That should make you at least smile a little bit, you know, you know. My taxes didn't come out right, but I am with Christ and I am in Christ. I'll smile just a little bit. Paul was looking for something to override this. Paul said, I'm looking for something to override this love. And he, he said, I looked, angels couldn't override it. Death couldn't override it. Principalities couldn't override it. There's no height that can override it. There's no depth that can override it. He said, I'm persuaded. And neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor anything that's coming. And I know you guys thinking, something's coming. It's coming. It's coming. And we're doomed. It's coming. Get ready. Not if you're a believer. I'm not from here. Not if I'm a believer. I'm not from here. I'm not doomed because nothing over overwhelms or overruns or overrules being in Christ and being with Christ. I love that. Colossians 3.1, Colossians 3.1, if you have your Bible, you can look at that. It says, if then, I love that, that's a scientific statement there. And that's every hypothesis starts with the if then statement, right? Professor Chase, if then, if I do this, then this, if then you have been raised with Christ. Okay, so the hypothesis is you've been raised with Christ. We will know that because you are seeking the things that are what? So I am saved from sin. I am saved. I am saved not by my works, but my works proved that I've been saved. I'm not saved by my works, but I prove that I'm saved by what I put my mind on. And if I have not have my, if I have all of my mind on everything down here, then we can, we can actually, people, don't you judge me. You're missing the text. See, I can actually have a conversation with you now because he said, if then, if then, my fear for you is, to me, if you're a person living, a non-believer, you would rather me judge you than him. You would rather hear it from me. <laughs> so if, if, if I was breaking the law and, and you came to me and said, man, you don't want to do that, if the cops find out, man, you don't you judge me, man, you better get out of my face, I do what I want. You was doing it. He's like, yeah, I man, I did 10 to, I did 10 to 12 years. You know, you know, once, don't you tell me. That's what I do, man. You was doing it. When you get pulled over, it's too late now. The cops put them in shackles on you. <laughs> clack, 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 clack. And then you're kind of like, I wish I would have listened to somebody who told me. We got to be real careful. See, the culture's got all these sayings, and now I see Christians saying them. That's my only beef. You know, leave the Bible out of it if you're going to say it. Then don't try to add the, don't try to throw something in there with it. That's the culture. It ain't Bible. It's Babel, not Bible. That's a free tweet. I won't charge you for that one. It's Babel, not Bible. See, I know those who are risen with Christ because they're seeking something different. Doesn't mean you're perfect, but you're seeking something different. You're living with conviction because you know you got, you know, we got, we know we got some work to do. We got some night classes to take. We got some things that we're pressing toward the mark for, but we're seeking something different. It didn't say you necessarily have, you, you've arrived and we don't, we don't arrive. But we're constantly dealing with this tension of, oh, thank you, God, I'm here, but he deserves more. When you're a believer, you're constantly in this tension of, I'm so glad I'm here, but he deserves more. And people who scare me are the ones who just go, I'm there. You are in Christ, you are with Christ. Galatians 3.25, look that up real quick. I'm almost there. We got one more happy thing. I want to show you one more verse for this. And if you have note sheets, there's all kinds of verses you can just read and just delight in and just be happy. Just be, just, just be happy. I feel like Harriet Tubman, like trying to free some sleep. Come on, let's go, let's go. We got, let's, there's jobs up there and there's, there's, we can get this stuff up here. We got this whole new life. And he's like, swing low, sweet Harriet. Come on, let's go. I'm just gonna sit here in my anger and my depression and, and how bad my life is. I'm just gonna wallow in it. And I understand what the kingdom is. <laughs> You need to get saved like me. Saved with no friends, my Lord. 
But now that faith has come, we're no longer under a garden for in Christ Jesus, in Christ, you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you were baptized into Christ, I put on Christ. So last week, all you people that were baptized, you were baptized into Christ. You are now in Christ Jesus. You have something to always be happy about. This can't be taken from you. This can't be stolen from you. Fourth thing to be happy about. You have the gift of gifts. According to the verse eight, you are saved by grace, not that of works lest a man should boast. It is a gift. You have the gift of gifts. You have the gift of gifts. That's, that's, Coach Feedback loves this word, sozo, salvation. That's the Greek word, it's in your notes there. It means to save, that is deliver or protect, to heal, preserve, save, do well, or make whole. Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall, Humpty Dumpty had a great fall, all the king horses, all the king's men, could put Humpty Dumpty back together again. They couldn't put Humpty, God comes on the scene and puts you back together again. God created, called it good, man blew it, God came in and fixed what man blew, gave him new life. New, new life, new purpose, new mission. Every day we're on mission. If you're a bank teller, you're on mission. If you work at the gas station, you're on mission. Every day, stay at home mom, you're on a mission. Every day, we're on mission every day. So if I'm on mission, if I've been given new life, I have new purpose, all right? I was dead and I was made alive. I was poor and it's Christ who made me rich. Why would I discriminate? Why would I treat anybody that God has made with contempt? Why would I discriminate between who I'm gonna sit by and who I'm not gonna sit by? Why would I make anybody feel anything but welcomed in the house of God? Why would I look down my nose at anyone knowing what we just read about ourselves in Ephesians 2? I'm okay with him as long as, he, as, long as his pants is up. That's not what the text says. That's not what the text says. James was questioning what type of faith was in the room? He was questioning what type of people were in the room. He's saying these are the same, these are the same rich people that persecute you all the time. And now you're trying to you're trying to get in with them? You see why I didn't go straight to James 2 now, Dr. Coach? You, you're trying to get in? These people do not care about you. In the text is what he's talking about. I'm not saying that. Can I say this? I don't know everybody's financial situation, but I'm rest just saying there's probably very few rich people in the, in the room, in the context of our country. Now, you take us around the rest of the world, you compare us to the rest of the world, everybody in this room is rich compared to the rest of the world. But in our context, I'm rest just saying that there's nobody in this room that can't lose all of their money in a bad weekend in Vegas. <laughs> all of us in this room spend one bad weekend in Vegas, come back going, please pray for me, I don't have nothing left. Bill Gates ain't got to worry about that, but we got to worry about that. That's my working definition this morning. I was trying to figure out what the definition of rich was back then. I mean, really, what's the definition of rich? We could argue about this all day. I mean, who, who knows? When I was growing up, we thought all white people were rich. We didn't know. We just thought they have cars. They're rich. Look at them. Can you give me a quarter? Fifty cents? <laughs> Don't lie. You ain't broke. Okay. But James 2 is really saying that there's something in us that places some people up here for whatever reason and other people down here. And then we start having partiality. We start playing favoritism. And re the real word, the real word today is discriminate. So James says, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with partiality. I'm just going to read it to you in James 2.1. He says, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with partiality. For if there should come into your assembly a man with gold rings 
and fine apparel. And there should also come a poor man in filthy clothes. And you pay attention to the one wearing fine clothes and say to him, yo, sit here in a good place. And let me tell you something. I can tell y'all some stories where that's happened in this congregation. Where people came up to me excited about who was here. And he was an owner and he had some, some money. DJ, you need to come meet this guy. You need to come, come on, come on, come meet this guy. I'm like, what are you excited about? <laughs> and then you say to the poor man, you stand over there, you sit here. That's what the third verse says. You're over there in the corner. Fourth verse, have you not shown partiality among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Look at this here. We got to, I'm talking to First Baptist Church. I'm talking to the people that attend and come here every two or three weeks. <laughs> it's about what it is, so don't get mad at me. I'm just telling you what it is. I'm the same way, so it's all good. <laughs> he said, hey, look, we need to examine. Are we that kind of church? Are we the people that have been made alive, but yet now we've arrived at this place where we can go, well, look at that. I wonder if they're married. Are they married or not married? Well, set them over there in the corner since they're not married. Just set them over there somewhere until they figure out this is God's house. We got money. Come on. Gotta, look at them. Don't dress right. Surely we don't have that going. Surely nobody here is doing that. Surely you can sit by anybody. Fifth verse. Listen, my beloved. Has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of his kingdom, which he promised to those who love him? See, our mission is to the least, the lost, and the last. Our mission is to the least, the lost, and the last. Our mission is to the least, the lost, and the last. That's our mission. Not to the good, the gooder, and the better. Six verse, but you have dishonored the poor man. Do not the rich oppress you and drag you into courts? Do they not blaspheme mean that noble name by which you are called? Eighth verse, if you really fulfill the royal law, according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You do well. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as a transgressor. For whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of it all. For he who said do not commit adultery also said do not murder. Now if you do not commit adultery but you do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so do as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. And here is where we'll end this morning. For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs. Mercy is victorious. Mercy is the one in the end zone. It's mercy that got the knockout. It's mercy that rings the bell to start the stock day in the kingdom. Mercy is the game changer. Mercy. In mercy is truth. See, until you know that you need mercy, this is the dilemma. This is the dilemma. Until you actually admit that you need it, then you don't understand what we're talking about. So if you're running around going, don't you judge me, and you ain't admitting that you need mercy, you've missed the point. But those of us who are promoting the kingdom need to remember we can't be discriminatory to who we love on. Am I in trouble this Sunday? I can already see emails coming. I'm ready. Here they come. I can already see them. You missed something, DJ. I know I didn't do this text. It's total justice. But I, I know what my homework assignment is. Were you the one that was dead and made alive? If so, you know good well you have no place for discrimination. Now, I did. I tried to find the out clause. I said, Lord, if somebody comes in here wearing a K-State shirt, I did. I was looking for an out clause. I said, Lord, do, they come in here with the K-State shirt. Do I have to really? Do I have to really? Really? I got to love on them, Lord, really? 
I mean, for some of y'all, some of y'all, he's, he's, saying, he's saying rich and he's using rich and poor. Some of us is an overarching thing for the whole kingdom. I mean, do I really have to love a Democrat? Do I really? If they're a Democrat? If I find out they're an Obama supporter, do I really? Do I, can I discriminate against all the Obama supporters and put them in a corner somewhere? And I think it's sad that we're like that in the kingdom. Because even unsafe military men don't act like that. Even unsafe military men who disagree with the president serve better than we do in the kingdom. Shame on us. If you're discriminating against somebody, doesn't mean they're right, doesn't mean you're condoning it, doesn't mean they get to do whatever they want. It doesn't mean that. It does, if you're hearing that, you've missed it. Just let them live their lives, okay? <laughs> if the church just lets people live their lives, we stop being on mission. I'm gonna say it one more time. If the church just sits back and let everybody live their life like they want to, we've stopped doing mission. So that ain't the message either. But judgment starts with the house of God and we have to walk in exceptional mercy for such a time as this. So here's the challenge that I'm going to put in everybody's ear and then I guess we go home after this, right? Is that what we do? It's been a couple weeks. <laughs> here's the challenge that I wanted to kind of throw at you. And one, I want you to, to, at this season of your life, just kind of evaluate what your mission is, okay? I want you to go home. I want you to spend some time. And if you've got a note sheet, right at the bottom of it, I need to evaluate what my mission is. This is a, we're in a great season as the body of Christ to do some self-reflecting, okay? What is your mission, okay? Because when we come into the house of God, this is, this is the priesthood of believers in this room. So I'm not the only gospel preacher. We're in the priesthood of believers, which means when I say yes to Christ, I'm now on the same priesthood. I have the same Holy Ghost. And so it ain't like, you know, I'm up here. I get to tell you what to think about every single scripture. And then you have to just accept it because I'm sitting, you know, you're on the right hand side of God. You're up, but I'm up just a little bit. I'm like in the bosom. The pastors are in the bosom of Christ. That's not what's going on here. <laughs> All right. So, so you ha we have to have everybody do mission. God's answer for this flawed world system is merciful people doing what they've been called to do. What is your mission? I want you to pray about that. I want you to really honestly pray about that. And then we as a church we all come together with all of these different gifts and missions and ideas and thoughts. But see, what I'm seeing happen is, man, people circumstantially are so beat up. They're so beat down. You're like, man, I can't. You're like Moses. Like, I can't do anything right now. I can't. I'm, I'm, I'm behind on this. And my daddy's sick. And my kid is hooked on phonics. And he's got all these things going on. You got all these reasons why I can't get on mission right now. You don't understand. <laughs> you don't understand, DJ. There's just so many things beating me up. That I can't get on mission. I can't, get, I can't be about it. I'm just saying that maybe your mission is right where you're at. So if you're going to go take care of your grandma because she's sick, you're on mission when you're taking care of grandma. That's all I'm saying. I'm not saying you got to go to China. I'm not saying you got to go to Cherry Street or the coffee. I'm not saying any of that. I'm just saying everywhere you step is mission. Because that's God's answer to a flawed system. If you're a person who doesn't know Jesus Christ as Savior, as Lord, you don't know that he made you alive, you've, you, you didn't realize till today that Christ has made you alive and given you new life, new purpose, new mission, I'm going to hang around for you to talk to you if that's you. All right? If you have a prayer request or a prayer concern, Find somebody on your row and share it with them. Amen? Find somebody on your row and share it with them. We don't need a long line to DJ as if I'm the only person here qualified to pray for others. Somebody say amen to me. God's going to flip the script on church. Either we all know the gospel and can share the gospel or the church is in trouble. Let's pray.
Lord, as we leave this place, help us to be on, help us to understand our mission starts when we step out of these doors. Um, give us strength, give us peace. And I pray, Lord, that we can throw seed without partiality. I pray that we wouldn't be intimidated by the words of other people, by how their heart seems. Help us not to be intimidated by what we think is happening, but help us to boldly share the gospel that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We thank you ahead of time for the harvest that is coming. We thank you ahead of time for the new life that is coming. And we thank you for the ahead of time for the enrichment that is coming to the house of God. In the name of Jesus, I pray.